Okay, good morning and welcome back to Healthcare Innovations Mid-Atlantic Virtual Summit. My name is Matthew Rayner. I'm the publisher here at Healthcare Innovation. We are so excited for day two of this week's program. Whether you are consuming this content live with us here today or watching on demand, thank you for being a part of this program. I would like to give a big thank you to our faculty that we have lined up here at the virtual summit. And also, of course, a big thank you to our supporters at Caroline and Nutanix for making this program possible. We encourage you to learn more about our supporters by visiting the virtual booth section within the event platforms website. You'll notice they have some wonderful educational content to share, as well as contact information if you do have interest in learning more. A very quick housekeeping note to help you along today if you're choosing to watch this content live. All of these sessions are designed to be interactive. If you have questions for our faculty today, please do not be shy. Submit it through the chat box within the Zoom platform. We'll do our very best to get through as many of your questions as we possibly can. We had some fantastic audience questions yesterday. We'd love to see a very similar engagement today. Speaking of today, today we have a total of four sessions lined up for you. We're going to kick things off with a fireside chat with Penn Medicine's John Donahue. Immediately following this fireside chat will be a panel discussion on making sense of the digital solutions available to your organization. These opening two sessions are being moderated by our editor-in-chief, Mark Haglin. And at this time, I would love to bring on Mark and turn things over to Mark Haglin. So Mark, go right ahead. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, let me just totally double check my sound here. Uh, okay, great. I just had to so slightly adjust it. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're so happy to have you back with us. Uh, we have a second exciting day, as Matt just mentioned. Um, we're going to do something really nice, I think, just now. Uh, I'm going to sit and talk for a half hour with John Donahue from Penn Medicine, and then we're going to open it up to a panel that will include John, as well as Dr. Arlen Myers and Brent Burns. Uh, so first, we're going to begin um, by talking with John. John, can you share with us just a little bit about your background, and then we'll talk about some uh, really innovative things you've been doing at Penn. Absolutely, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Um, so I've been in uh, healthcare leadership for probably close to 35 years now, came up through the ranks uh, as a technician and I've kind of worked my way into my current role, have been with Penn Medicine in Philadelphia for about 12 years. And uh, my current responsibility is what they call entity services. So the vice president of entity services, we have 13 of what we call entities, hospitals and large uh, outpatient facilities. Each of them have a mini EIO or a mini CIO, excuse me that we call an entity information officer and a group of people that support that local entity. So that's where my focus has been over the, uh, the last year or so. But prior to that, I, I built out our security practice. I insourced our infrastructure and have worn many hats in the 12 years. That's wonderful. <clears throat> well, you're the perfect person to speak on this with us. Um, we had decided we wanted to, wanted to talk about two broad subjects. One was uh, your uh, involvement in helping to lead uh, the establishment of a new patient pavilion at Penn. And then we also wanted to talk about workforce development and with the strong connection between the two. So with regard to the pavilion, just tell us a little bit about um, the pavilion, how it was, um, how it came to be created and some of the really interesting challenges and opportunities around IT infrastructure related to it. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I think my first meeting on this pavilion project was seven years ago. And this is one of those once in a career type projects. So it's a you know, 1.5 million square foot, 17 story, 500 bed, uh, 50 operating room facility in West Philadelphia on our campus with the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. So, you know, when you think about Penn Medicine, you know, our history goes back over 250 years. And, you know, we really approached this project and said, we're going to build a digital hospital that'll be standing in another hundred years. And when you start to think in those terms and you think of the developments in medicine, and, 
you know, the mission that we have, it, it's a pretty special opportunity to be part of something like that. So, you know, it started with, um, you know, a bunch of design work. Obviously, we brought in some world class people from across across the globe to help us design and architect the building. There was a, a hotel in the spot where we wanted to build the building. So we had to very carefully do some demolition. And, um, you know, the reason it was careful, obviously, was our, our main hospitals across the street from that. We needed to be worried about air quality. And the University of Penn Museum sat right against the building that mm. we were de demolishing. So some, um, some serious uh, design work around how to bring the building down before we could even start. Uh, once we started the building, uh, it, it was fascinating to watch all these different trades and all these different folks work collaboratively. Um, again, I, I shared with you that we did a bunch from a design perspective. Our, uh, our CEO, who is very visionary, actually built out a half a floor in styrofoam in a, uh, in a uh, company downtown. There was a warehouse space. And it was fascinating to see us build out something of that scale out of styrofoam and then do um, time and motion studies. We brought in doctors, we brought in nurses, and we had them, you know, act as if they were coming off elevators with gurneys. And, you know, we learned so much from being able to, you know, really work with this mock-up. Um, we took hundreds of suggestions, we tore it all down, and we rebuilt it with the suggestions and did it all over again. And it was really instrumental in getting it right because we had a chance to sort of see what it would look like before we actually built it. Construction probably started um, four years ago or so. It was the largest concrete job in the Philadelphia, the history of the city of Philadelphia, which uh, you know wow. obviously says an awful lot. And you know, we've been watching it, um, you know, rise through the the city landscape, and uh, we will be patient ready in uh, the October November timeframe of this year. Um, you can imagine in March of last year, in the middle of the the final stages of construction, we were hit with COVID and the, the yeah. pandemic, and you know, we had to get creative pretty quickly. At any given day, we'd have seven or 800 uh, tradespeople on the floor doing work and working towards an aggressive time frame. So we really wanted to focus on the safety of them as well as trying to continue as much construction as we could. So we brought some tools in that ensured that there was social distancing and ensured that there was some contact tracing if there were any issues. And we lost a couple of months, but given the fact of the duration of the pandemic, I think all in all, we're probably delayed by about three months, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, uh, it really shows the uh, the focus and the commitment of the team that's responsible for this particular project. So, first of all, I agree. It's very exciting that you were able to literally be involved from the ground up on this. Many healthcare IT leaders never have that opportunity in their lifetime. So, that's, that's kudos to kudos to you. What were some of the biggest challenges um, from your standpoint in terms of helping to manage this project and how did you overcome them? Yeah, so a couple of things. One is, um, you know, I think that early on senior leadership here at Penn Medicine was wise enough to create some dedicated resources for the project. So unlike some projects where you have a day job and then you try to work on things as time allows, they pulled senior facilities folks, senior nurses, senior clinicians, and said, this is gonna be your job for the next several years. You're part of this Penn First team. And that really gave us an opportunity to um, leverage their expertise. And we built out some colo space where we brought in the architects and the designers and the construction people and had them live with this Penn First team, which included members from the IS team during this time. So that really helped from a, a coordination and a collaboration perspective. You know, I, I think challenges, you know, for us, you know, selfishly as an IS group and, and other IT leaders, this will resonate with them is you know, the first thing you do is you say, hey, we need some closets and we need them to be this size. And, you know, the, the leaders of the building say, well, you know, that's patient care space. You know, you can't have that much, you know, space for closets. And, you know, if I look back five years, we tried to say, all right, things are getting smaller, but there's more technology in the building. So we need to yeah. leave space for, for growth. We need to make sure we pull enough cabling, even though Wi-Fi is obviously gonna be prevalent, we wanted to make sure that we had enough cabling in the building. So we stole from our CEO's idea and built out cardboard closets and said, this is what these things are gonna look like once we're fully populated. And it actually made a difference. You know, I think that the bad outcome for them was build the building, they walk into these closets and they look like echo chambers. Well, we were able to show based on our equipment orders, what these things were gonna look like the day the building opened. And, and that helped an awful lot. So, so that was a challenge. And then from there, I think, Mark, it's the complexity of, of 
you know, all the different trades as well as our, you know, cable pullers for, co for fiber and copper and, you know, all of our service providers working in the building and understanding dependencies and not getting too far ahead of one another where you'd have to restart work or redo work. Clearly you have to be flexible in a building of this size, you know, so there's changes on the fly, uh, design changes, there's, uh, you know, changes with the way that walls are gonna look and things like that. So you really have to be very agile and make sure that you're plugged into this group so that as changes happen, you understand the impact, again, selfishly on IT systems. Yeah, I think it's such an interesting um, combination of challenges and opportunities because here you were creating something new, which in and of itself is both a challenge and an opportunity, right? And you also had to essentially, from what you're telling me, negotiate certain elements, right? I, I think that's interesting. I think it's interesting for a healthcare IT leader. And I'm glad you had the foresight in terms of the amount of space or equipment because um, so, I mean, it seems like a really simple thing. And yet in many cases, there isn't the foresight and very quickly, even in a new pavilion, um, people find they're running out of space, which is not a great thing. It's a balancing act, right? You have to be reasonable. You have to be prudent. You have to really understand what space you need. And then you have to fight like heck for it. Yeah, and we, exactly. we built out 49 closets and, uh, you know, they're, they've got the proper cooling, they've got the proper, you know, lighting, and they've got the proper racking that's all labeled and documented. I mean, this building is going to be a pleasure to support because we did it right. And along those lines, you know, we wanted to build out, you know, what we think of as a main distribution frame. So it was a main connection point for our providers to come into. And it almost looks like a data center space. And that was very similar right. in terms of our negotiation is how do you make sure that you, you say loud enough, we need this space. And if we don't get the space, here's, here's the outcome. And again, we, we worked with a really talented group of folks who asked us some very tough questions and we were prepared. And I think we got to a really good outcome that's not gonna only serve IS, but is gonna serve the institution and ultimately the community of Philadelphia. Absolutely. What have been the biggest couple few learnings from, from the process? <clears throat> So I think the biggest learning for us is doing something that in some ways nobody had ever done before. So we really wanted to have this digital experience in the uh, patient room. And we wanted to build that around what we call our yeah. football. And listen, there are other digital hospitals out there that are people who have been incredibly innovative and, and I don't want to sell other folks short, but you know, we wanted just to, to, to design this in a way that served Penn Medicine's needs and our community's needs. And you know, when you start to do something like that, the, the downside is you tend to rely on the people that you work with. And that's what I call an internal view. So you're relying on the people's experience that are around the table with you. We learned early on that we needed to bring some folks in from the outside, some folks that had done it before. And we engaged with a, an integration partner that's just been a pleasure to work with. And they have been a force multiplier for us in terms of uh, really partnering and making sure we understand how the technology is gonna work together. And, uh, you know, making it work seamlessly together in that patient room from a digital perspective. Very important lessons. Um, and I'll, I'll just also say it's an interesting time because, and we'll be talking about this with the other gentlemen in a, a few minutes, um, there's such a plethora of choices now. And I, I'm certain you went through some really good uh, governance uh, and uh, project management processes as you consider the technology we're going to implement? Absolutely, Mark. So governance is part of our DNA here at Penn Medicine and, and probably has been for an awful long time. So, you know, we have to make sure all of our constituents are lined up and agreeing that things are the right thing to do. And um, I tend to call that going slow to go fast because it takes a while to get all the constituents lined up. But once you have them lined up, you know, the, the skids are greased and you can really go ahead and make progress. But to your point, we, we have a, a pretty deep governance process here and any kind of introduction of new technology um, goes through that governance process and, and people get a chance to vote. And then we look at ourselves and say, all right, what could we do differently? And sometimes we go back to the drawing board. Sometimes we're 90% of the way there and we come back with a quick update. But that governance is so important on a project of this magnitude. I, I think any project it's important, but when you talk to start to talk about things of this scale, governance is absolutely critical. And then the second thing you mentioned is, you know, we, we think of that as core to some of our success as a corporate IT team, and that's our project management office. And on this project, there are probably 55 PMs that are dedicated. 
and uh, I'll share with you, we went to uh, probably five, six years ago, we went up to New York and visited one of our peer organizations who was in a project like this. And I think they had 97 dedicated PMs and we shook our head and said, yeah, there's no way. That's yeah, it's a huge commitment. Uh, we came back and found a way to do it a little bit more, uh, maybe economically, a little bit differently, a little bit more innovatively. But even saying that, you know, most organizations don't have 55 PMs they can allocate. And these are ISPMs allocated to a project of this magnitude. So. Um, data governance or the governance process and the project management, understanding uh, the dependencies, understanding what happens when there's delays, absolutely critical in a project of this magnitude. Absolutely, I absolutely agree. And in, in about 15 minutes, we'll be talking with Arlen and Brent about their perspectives on uh, governance and project management. So this was such a great ca case study to bring forward. Uh, meanwhile, John, the second element that we wanted to talk about today was your workforce management initiative. Um, why don't you begin just uh, by fleshing it out a little bit for us so we understand what's going on. It's so innovative. Yeah, so it's interesting. I think if, if I went pre-pandemic, you know, we have always been focused on our workforce. It's people first. And that's not just Penn Medicine, but it's corporate IS. We, we have a, a very high retention rate, low turnover rate. We've worked hard to build a culture of developing people, developing leaders, creating career opportunities for people. And so even pre-pandemic, we were looking for ways to, to make our team more effective and more efficient and what technologies we could implement. You know, with the pandemic coming along in March of last year, it really made us accelerate some of our activities. You know, how do you have a remote workforce? You know, prior to that, you know, our 950 corporate IT folks were sitting in the office every day and it was easy to build a culture when I know I'm gonna see Mark four or five times a day as I walk by his office or we walk back from a meeting together. Um, but how do you how do you build and maintain that in a in a remote environment? You know, what technologies are necessary and how quickly can you spin them up? And then how do you introduce new people into the workforce? How do you make sure that uh, productivity is high? And then as you fast forward a little bit to the last couple of weeks, it's how do you begin to have some kind of a hybrid return to office scenario? And, and how do you do all that from you know, beginning to end without losing focus on the critical projects that you're working on, like our Pavilion project, like some of our large enterprise software deployments, some of our large technology refresh projects without missing a beat and without spending money that's not necessary to, to, to spend. So um, I think we, we've been pretty proactive. Um, you know, our CIO, um, again, is all about the people and making sure that our communications are, are top notch and we regularly communicate with our folks. We, uh, you know, I, I talk to some organizations and you get on a Teams call and everybody's video is off. And, you know, it seems like people are off doing other things. You know, we're highly engaged when we have a Teams meeting with 15 people on there. Cameras are on and people are expected uh, to be paying attention and fully yes. engaged. It's made a difference. It, it really has. So, you know, again, our, our culture has been people first. Our culture has been around creating some internal opportunities. We promote somewhere in the neighborhood of about 80 people every year internally which um, tends to really build confidence in you know, our ability to uh, create career paths for people. Um, we've been able to scale as we've grown as an organization, it's created opportunities for new managers, new directors, you know, new senior leaders. So um, you know, I'm not sure if that's sort of the genesis of your question, but that's been our approach to developing a team and, and trying to figure out how to work remotely. And yeah, no, it's, it's perfect, John. I, I think that one of the things that has always fascinated me and I've, I've been, in healthcare publishing for 32 years now, is what, what is people, right? Um, it's how how you how one creates a thriving organization, and so often in the in the work world, one thinks of financial outcome, and obviously financial outcome is a factor in everything. But time and time again, we've seen that healthcare leaders who are able to create cultures that encourage people and support people do have the retention. Um, would you speak to the question of, I mean, healthcare IT is so interesting because generally speaking, and I suppose I should whisper this so no one hears it, uh, one can make more money outside healthcare, right? Whisper, whisper. Um, <laughs> and I often end up I and my team end up interviewing um, people in positions like yours of senior healthcare IT leadership. They, of course, they know this. You know this. Sure. You, you could lose people to, you know, Apple or whoever. Um, 
And one of the things that has to happen is a culture has to be created in which people really want to stay, right? Um, there is already so much turnover in all technology related positions, kind of in general, right? That we have to deal with. How do you, um, again, we'll, we'll just whisper, no one will know. Uh, how is it that you're able to create the retention levels that you have? What is the secret sauce of that? Again, in the context that it's a field, all IT uh, is somewhat, is one in which people move around somewhat in general. I mean, healthcare is a little bit of an outlier in general in that way. Um, so what is your secret sauce? So there's a couple of things that come to mind, Mark. One is, you know, we try to work hard, and this is my terminology, um, looking at tugs and shoves, right? So the tugs are the things that keep you in an organization. What are the things that you like? And the shoves are the things that you say, oh, man, this frustrates me and this yeah. keeps happening. I'm going to look for a new job. And once you understand some of those things, you can begin to create more tugs and eliminate some of the shoves. And that's really important. Um, you know, we look at when people leave the organization, why they left the organization. And yeah. you know, for a long time, again, our, our turnover was sub 5%. And most of the people had left because their spouse got a job across the country or they changed jobs, careers and things like that. So we really, you know, we're very proud of our, our track record. Uh, we also, and this is not, you know, you know, rocket science to anyone, is people like working for their managers. Most people that leave organizations leave yeah. because they don't um, like their manager that they're working for. So we invest a ton of time in mentoring and education, both formal and informal. And I'm really getting our management team up to speed because we think that's where the, the yeah. rubber meets the road. If you have good managers, typically your subject matter experts will stay. Two other things that I think about on this front is, um, one is for us when we hire people, we really go through a lot of scrutiny. So, you know, we have some metrics and, you know, for every person we hire, we've gone through, you know, no exaggeration, 115 resumes, we've had 32 interviews. So we really want to make sure we get the right person. And we talk about fit here, you know, so it's not always the smartest person, you know, yeah. if you, you know, a big hockey guy. So if you look at Herb Brooks, when he built the 1980 Olympic team, he didn't pick the best talent, he picked the right talent. Yeah. And, and we, we take that approach. And so we look at um, attitude, aptitude and energy. And those are the three things that we're looking at when we're looking at candidates because we think their attitude's gotta be good. This is a team game. You can't come into an IT organization yeah. and sit in a cube and work by yourself on something. It's, it's a team environment. Energy, you know, this is a, it's a, it's a uh, fast paced environment. You know, if you don't come in here with a ton of energy every morning ready to hit the ground running, you tend to uh, get swallowed up. And then, you know, obviously aptitude, if you're, if you're not good at what you're doing, you're not gonna fit in long here at all. So we find that when we focus on those things, and for example, I, I interview everybody that gets hired within my unit. It doesn't matter if they're the most junior person, I make sure that I get 15, 20 minutes with them and get a chance to gauge the fit. And then the last thing I would say, Mark, is, is around the mission of what Penn Medicine does. And you know, if you think about the things that we're doing to, to help the community versus you know, a tire manufacturer down the street that might be paying an extra five grand a year. And, and what I find is it's only a matter of time before somebody on our team has a family member that needs health care. You know, whether it be a brother, sister, mother, daughter. And, and when they come in and, and they see the dedication of our physicians and the world-class health care, they tend to say, look, this is about more than paycheck. I want to be part of this. This is an A team and I buy into the mission. I've seen it up front and close and it gets personal for people. So yeah. those are a couple of different thoughts. I think when you, you get people drinking the juice of the mission, you hire them with the right fit and you identify those tugs and shrugs, shrugs you can um, really build a good team. Right, I think that's absolutely true, John. I, I think one of the things that many people know, not everyone, but um, in healthcare IT is that there has to, you have to set your organization apart with something why are they going to work for you? And as you said, not the tired people down the street, or you know, there there are a lot of IT people working in industries, and I don't I don't want to malign any industry. Every industry is important, but that aren't so mission focused. Um, so I I really salute you that you take that time and care to choose the right people. I agree absolutely. People stay in jobs. They may come to a job for a variety of reasons, but they stay usually for the people and the sense of purpose. And if, if they don't have that, it's, it's very easy to leave. 
Yeah, there's no doubt. And, and you just hit on another important thing that I didn't touch on, Mark. So, you know, it's that sense of purpose. And how do you draw a connection between what somebody's doing and what they're reading about in the newspaper? So whether it's Penn's work on the COVID vaccine development or it's this patient tower. And I think we've started to do a much better job of being able to draw those lines such that even the most junior people say, I can see what I'm doing is contributing to that yeah. mission, contributing to those projects. And, and that's the meaningful work that you talk about. It's critical. That's great. Yeah, that's such a great point. Um, every person needs to understand that they're not just some kind of cog. You know, they're they're not they're not just digging a ditch, right? They're what they do, whatever the specific task is that they're working on in a day. And usually, it's of course more than one task. Um, they're that task is part of a larger whole. It it has purpose and meaning and that provides the satisfaction, as well as, of course, using one's skills and abilities uh, and experiences. So this has been so great, uh, John. Any last thoughts before uh, we turn to the panel? You know, my last thought on this personnel issue is, um, you know, I think as time goes on, we're going to continue to um, have to really focus on the people side of things. You know, to, to your point, there are certain segments in the um, in the industry, like information security and some clinical providers where the demand is always going to outstrip, you know, the, the supply, if you will. Um, so I think as leaders, we need to get creative. We need to create that um, mission. We need to get, you know, personal with our folks. You know, I, I think here, you know, our CIO knows every one of his direct reports, you know, kids' names and, and in some cases their pets' names. And I think that creates that sense of you know, tug as well. So I think uh, over time, it's only going to become more competitive in some of those key areas. And as leaders, we're going to have to figure out a way not only to recruit those folks, but retain those folks. And, you know, the, the um, force multiplication of, of those folks being at an organization for a long period of time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, the, the honest truth is, and again, I'll, I'll whisper this, uh, healthcare will never be able to compete with some of the other industries purely on pay. Right. We, we just won't. And so we have to, we have to be appealing in other ways. Um, it's like a, a beauty pageant. The, the winner isn't chosen only on looks. They're also chosen on, you know, being able to play the piano or tap dance or spin plates. So um, great conversation, John. This has been so helpful. It's actually quite inspiring, I think. So thank you. It's been you. my pleasure. Absolutely. So now you're going to stick around. And um, I'm going to open up the panel and we're going to ask Brent Burns and Dr. Arlen Myers to join us. Good morning. And I think Brent is there also and we'll, there we go. <laughs> Good morning, morning, gentlemen. Now we are four. Um, it, the, welcome, welcome. So you, you've been able to hear uh, what John and I were just talking about, and we're going to talk about uh, governance, project management, and all those other factors. But first, let me have each of you um, introduce yourself, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, and maybe connect that to what we're going to be discussing. So we'll start with uh, Brent, why don't you uh, share with the audience about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Mark. And uh, John, I really enjoyed uh, enjoyed your talk. A lot of uh, a lot of things resonated uh, here as well. Thank uh, you. So pr appreciated it. Um, so my name is Brent Burns. Um, I'm part of uh, our organization called UPMC Enterprises. Um, my background is I grew up in the Silicon Valley um, in the venture community as a as a banker and a product manager, um, and then uh, for a large healthcare conglomerate doing strategy, BD, and IT uh, work for a number of years, and then uh, moved to Pittsburgh uh, with that, that company, and, um, and then eventually made my way to, uh, to UPMC Enterprises. Um, and it's been uh, just a, a privilege, you know, having, you know, the, the um, payer side, the provider side, and the opportunity to really get after hard problems. And, um, you know, our group uh, is really focused on two things, digital solutions, as well as translational sciences. We, in the digital realm, we have about 200 people as part of our, our group. And, you know, our mission is to really look at hard problems within the system and opportunities to continue to incubate them, to um, 
look from a build by partner process, you know, how do we, how do we get after some of these, these hard problems and work with our clinicians and our care managers to, uh, to help, to help solve them. Um, we have, today we have uh, about 30 companies, pretty broad spectrum. Um, you know, at the large end, we've got a couple of companies we've taken public over the last couple of years. And at the other end, we're working with uh, small seed companies where we're able to jump in and be a very early customer um, where we're able to provide co-development resources. So using some of our engineering talent, our design talent, our product management talent to help them evolve their, their, their company and their, their solution. And then capital. So we're able to kind of, what we call the, the three C's is, uh, you know, customer co-development and capital to help these, uh, these companies along. Um, Mark, what would else would be helpful from a background perspective? No, that's really good. Are you, and are, do you have an engineering background or just personally, or uh, what is your professional development background? Sure. So pro professionally, again, it's a, uh, it is a, it's a, it's a little bit of a mishmash. Uh, so, you know, I grew up a product manager as well as a banker, which is a, probably a confusing path and then just general management and business development. Um, okay. and so I think a lot of what John talked about in terms of how you build great teams and the culture and still are certainly things that, uh, that, uh, resonate with me and how we, we build our companies and, uh, and tackle some of the problems that we, we try to tackle. That's perfect, Brent. Thank you so much. Dr. Arlen Myers, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And uh, I too enjoy your comments, John, uh, particularly as I mentioned, since I'm a Penn alum. So it's nice to see things moving along. My background is uh, uh, I uh, went through a fairly traditional medical background, uh, medical school, residency, uh, and was a bit after residency was recruited to the faculty at the University of Colorado, where essentially I spent my entire first career. Um, so I did that for a pretty long time, uh, going up the food chain in academia. And then um, somewhere late, uh, somewhere in the mid 90s, late 90s, uh, myself and a couple of other people invented a gadget that optically detects cancer. I'm a ear, nose and throat oral surgeon kind of a guy. So I'm interested in oral cancer. That was kind of my deal. And uh, we essentially created what I would refer to as the Geiger counter for cancer using optical technologies. So what I learned from that was uh, that uh, every white coat thinks they have a good idea. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, and when I say white coat, I mean health professional, bioengineer, graduate student, you name it, um, which is where I play. I, I play at the at an academic medical center like Penn or UPMC or this is at the University of Colorado. So every white coat thinks they have a good idea, including me. Um, they generally do not have a good idea from the standpoint of commercialization. I'm not saying basic science is a bad idea. I'm just saying from this conversation in terms of business development and creating a product, um, it, it, they're generally not good ideas. And even if they had a good idea, they wouldn't know what to do with it because the last point is nobody teaches them what to do with it including me. So in medical school, medical societies, medical associations, graduate school, they simply don't teach you innovation and entrepreneurship. So yet, and we're, we're trying to change that, but the point is I was clueless. So I got pretty frustrated and long and the short of it is, so I wound up at the appropriate time, basically being an emeritus professor, I stopped seeing patients and I tell people that I went from a mission of education, research, uh, development, commercialization, patient care and community service in ear, nose and throat surgery in a medical school to doing the same thing in innovation and entrepreneurship. So now I do innovation and not healthcare innovation and entrepreneurship education in various schools, including our business school. I do, um, uh, research and commercialization as a consultant with companies trying to do this stuff. Um, I do um, community service running an international nonprofit, the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. Um, and I do corporate care instead of patient care, which is working with companies to try to get them to the next level. So that, that's kind of my background and, and sort of my portfolio at this point. Perfect. I love the idea of corporate care 
we we corporate folks do need care. I know I do. Yeah, uh, well, take, yeah, taking care of companies in many, many ways is a lot like taking care of patients. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. So welcome, everyone. Uh, as, as I mentioned, of course, uh, Brendan Arlen, you heard what I was discussing uh, moments ago with John. Let's talk, you know, maybe I'll, I'll just do a little bit of a level set from my perspective. Never before has there been a moment in which there have been so many needs and wants on the part of uh, all the stakeholders and patient care organizations, as well as so many technologies and yet on a certain level, so much confusion, right? Because there's so many options. I, I sometimes um, um, think of it in my mind as being like when you, now when you go to a modern supermarket and you there's a whole cereal aisle, breakfast cereal aisle, and you have a choice of like literally 100 cereals, uh, which um, psychologists tells, tell us we're not prepared as human beings to handle that level of choice that we can, our thinking kind of breaks down. Um, and yet at the same time, along with all these needs and wants and organizations, uh, we're more strapped than ever economically. And certainly the pandemic uh, impacted patient care organizations as well. So the need to really think before we act is in my view, more is starker than ever. Um, Let's talk about governance and project management when it comes to selecting technology. Um, it's something that, I mean, obviously if you just stop someone on the street and said, don't you think there should be a process before you buy something important or expensive, the average lay person will say, well, yes, of course that makes sense, but it's so much more complex than that in patient care organizations. And I would add one other element, which is I think that we're at the point now too, where many of the solutions we're talking about are nuanced and complex and the end users, particularly clinicians when they're clinical solutions really have to be brought in from the very beginning, right? Because otherwise you end up with a suboptimal outcome. So let's start at 40,000 feet and our, kind of work our way down in maybe increments of 5,000 feet at a time. Anyone can jump in. What do you think the top things are that um, healthcare IT leaders um, and those who work with them need to be thinking about as they think about this whole uh, subject of new solutions, new tools that are out there and how one thinks about acquiring and implementing them. Yeah, please go ahead, Aaron. Um, so I, my uh, take homes are these uh, and it, it dovetails into what John was talking about. Um, first of all, I think when you're trying to import or evaluate or vet a technology idea that someone wants to implement in your, let's say, health service organization, hospital, entity, whatever you want to call it. Um, I call them the five eyes. You, you kind of have to think through the whole process. Mm -hmm. So those are ideation, which means what problem are you trying to solve? You, you need to be a problem seeker, not a problem solver as the very first step. Because I think, and the evidence seems to bear out, and I'm interested in other folks, that if you don't solve the right problem, you're dead in the water. And that means having a clinical champion. It means understanding you know, the whole workflow and the issues and the systemic effects and et cetera, et cetera. So the first is ideation. The second is innovation. Once you understand the problem in the customer, and the job they want you to do and the jobs, pains and gains and the value proposition and product market fit and all the lean startup stuff, then you have to come up with a solution that essentially satisfies their needs. The third then is integration because now you have all these issues with, okay, we understand the problem. We've created a solution that seems to work, but then how do we fit it into pen med given everything we just heard? Workflow, people, systems, governance, money, budgets, recruitment, staff, resources, et cetera. Hot, cybersecurity, legacy systems, et cetera, et cetera. The simple, how do you integrate it into the electronic medical record? 
I mean, it's a very simple question, but it's extremely complicated, time consuming and very expensive. So you have to sort of think all that through. The fourth is implementation and dissemination. Okay, now you got the project up and running, you got it stuck or bolted onto your legacy systems. How do you get the staff to use it and actually understand where it's supposed to be used? And finally, the fifth one is impact or how do you, how do you measure the result of what you have just done, whether it's objectives, key results, whatever key performance indicators, whatever outcome measurements you want to use. And then you got to go back and start all over again because you probably didn't do it right the first time. And now you got to go back in a continuous quality improvement loop and say, well, we gave it our best shot. Here's some things we need to tweak. Here's some things we need to get rid of. Here's some things we need to kill and replace it with something else. And it's a constant iterative loop. Now that said, if that's the process, then what are, in my, in my observation, given what I told you I do, here's, here's what I see. And I think it's very similar to building a building, just like John outlined. So the issues are, I don't believe that sick care can be fixed from inside, just like he didn't believe that inside people could totally inform the thinking behind building this building. You have to get outside people who aren't stuck in the same mindset and brainwashed to give you new ideas and challenge you. So you can't fix it from inside. So there has to be open innovation. Number two, you have to have a blueprint. You can't build a building on the back of an envelope. You have to sort of have a blueprint, but you know you're gonna make changes. You know there are gonna be change orders. You know there's gonna be an agile process because as you build this thing, you're never gonna get it 100% right, but you have to have some guardrails. What are the strategic objectives? Are we gonna focus on oncology? Or are we gonna focus on orthopedics? Are we gonna focus, focus on virtual care? Or are we gonna focus on an inpatient virtual experience? So you have to give people some guidance in terms of yeah. what do we want? Otherwise, I think you wind up with a high tech suggestion box because everybody's throwing garbage over the transom and you're just overwhelmed with virtual care companies. There's over 265 virtual care companies now. So we went from zero to a hundred in 14 months and folks like Brent and John have to now vet these things and figure out who's the real deal. It's just overwhelming. So you have to set some guidelines and clarify the expectation. That's driven by governance which John just alluded to. You have to have a process, a structure, a process, a way to solicit, vet, and choose projects that you are going to get involved with. Yeah. On, on, so each side understands the rules of the game. Do not send us projects about orthopedics. And if I see another spine screw, I'll scream. We're interested in something else. We're interested in virtual congestive heart failure care at home. We're initiating a major hospital to home initiative and give us your best shot for heart failure. And then there's project management and that gets to doing a pilot. And we could talk a long time about the ins and outs of winding up in pilot purgatory, but basically it has to do with project management clarifying expectations, assigning the right people, figuring out what you're going to do if the project fails, or more importantly, if the project succeeds. What are we going to do when this project actually works? And what's that going to look like moving forward? Is Penn going to take an equity stake? Is UPMP, UPMC want to want 30% of your company? What's the revenue stream going to look like? How are we going to do this moving forward? And then finally, and I think the most important part is this doesn't happen without a culture of innovation at an institution overlapping with an entrepreneurial mindset of the staff. So when you're talking about physician entrepreneurs, and I'm talking about either external people, that is entrepreneurs, or internal people, intrapreneurs, the people who are your employees, 
who are trying to add user-defined value to the Penn Medicine or UPMC, they have to be internally driven. And it's the same when picking folks. He said, here are the things we look at when we pick IT staff. The way I paraphrase that is, you got to pick people who make it personal, but don't take it personal. In other words, they have to have an internal voice that is driving them to do this, whether it's a personal experience, whether it's a mission, whether it's they had a, you know, they have a sick kid and they want something to happen, that sort of stuff. But you will ultimately fail and you don't take that personally. You're going to have to make adjustments. Like he said, you know, there's, there's pushes and pulls, um, there's carrots, there's sticks, and you have to kind of work around those things to, to retain people and continually, but you have to rely on internal motivation. External motivation will only get you so far, and that's been shown over and over again. It's only going to do so much raising the salary to retain staff. They're going to go somewhere else, particularly with generational differences when we're looking at Gen Z and all these other generational attitudes about mission, purpose, triple bottom line, you know, meaning, all that other stuff. So those are just my comments. Wonderful. Thank you so much. There's a lot of meat there that we can chew on. Uh, Brett, let me let you um, uh, say a few things. First of all, sure. any responses to uh, some of the elements that uh, Arlen just brought up and how you see governance overall? Sure. No, I, so we certainly resonate with how Arlen uh, described the five eyes um, and, and I think follow a very similar similar mindset. Um, taking a step back, I think your, your question, Mark, about governance, you know, we, we effectively have three layers. At the highest level, you know, we have a subset of the UPMC board that's really helping set the strategic direction and what are the major things that will move the needle within the system to help patient, patient care. Um, I think the second is we, you know, we work very closely with our operators, uh, both on our uh, provider side as well as as uh, as health plan, mm. to really kind of sift out the uh, sift out the, uh, the the major problems uh, to Arlen's point that the, the system or challenges that we we have, and then the last is just within our group. Um, it's it's you know for within enterprises, it's it's really a venture mindset, and it's you know again looking at the hard problem and where we want to play. Um, you know, how do we really get after the, the problem and, and why are we better suited versus working with somebody from the, the outside and then looking at the resources needed to, to do this right, I think to John's point in his opening. Um, I think back to the operator piece and, and one piece that I would kind of pull out uh, for debate here is, you know, we spend more than half of our time when, when uh, technology opportunities kind of get presented within the system, mm -hmm. talking people out of technology. And what I mean by that a lot of time is it's a strategy problem. It's a communication, it's an operate, you know, operating problem. And, uh, you know, so technology can support those, those efforts, but uh, really aligning on strategy communication operations, you know, tends to solve a lot of, a lot of the problems that we, we face. Yeah. And I, and I, I think I love, I love your saying we, we spend a lot of time trying to convince people not to buy something or not to, that, that it's not necessarily a let's buy issue. Let me go back to John on that. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot of experiences with that, John. What percentage of time, just very roughly, do you, and, and I'm not talking about your new uh, pavilion because that's a separate issue. Obviously you needed technology. But apart from that, when you have discussions about potentially purchasing something, about what percentage of the time do you end up actually not purchasing something? I'd have to say 80%, 85% of the time. Wow. And you know, we're, we're fairly practical. So there's two things that inform a lot of our division to, uh, decisions. One is our roadmap, and then two is our budget. So you know, Arlen can come to us with the best things in sliced bread, and if we're not in the budget cycle and it doesn't have an immediate return, it's, he's swimming upstream to try to get some attention on that. And if he talked a little bit about that is what are the things that are relevant? What are the pain points that you're trying to solve at any given moment? So, you know, we use our governance process sometimes as a, uh, as a tool to vet out that shape yeah. from the, from the, the wheat. And um, I would gotta say 80, 85% of that stuff never makes it to somebody's desk where they're making a decision on a contract or an investment. 
And, and that's the way our, our culture is built. That's the way that governance is built specifically to minimize that. And occasionally you find a diamond in the rough or you find something that wasn't on your roadmap, but it's enough of a winner. Or, you know, like in the case of COVID, you know, all of a sudden our roadmap changed a little bit. Our needs changed a little bit. Yeah. Technologies that we might have laughed at six months before that all of a sudden were, you know, relevant to, you know, our mission. Uh, but it's a huge percentage. Don't, don't make it beyond the front door. Um, you know, I think Arlen or maybe Brent used the word champion. I think, you know, without a champion internally, it's even harder. So even if you have a great solution at the right time in the right place, without somebody who's willing to champion and that put some skin in the game, it's, it's a tough row. Yeah, exactly. I think I'm glad you mentioned the pandemic because one, you know, we all, first of all, just on a very high level, I always say, wow, who needed a global pandemic, right? Like this thing just kind of crashed into the earth and affected all of us, all people. Uh, but specifically in terms of healthcare in the United States, one of the interesting elements of the pandemic was it showed um, many healthcare, many patient care organization leaders, what was really necessary, what was really essential and kind of what wasn't. Um, and it helped people realize that they could move their governance processes uh, and management processes faster if they needed to. I thought that was interesting. Now, in terms of how that relates to this, um, another legacy was, as, as we all know, most patient care organizations moved as much patient care delivery to virtual uh, initially as they could. And that varied by type of organization, et cetera. But what became clear was telehealth, which had really never caught on before the pandemic, right? A small number of patient care organizations in the US used it beyond like 10%, right? But now people realize, wow, this really is important. And they also realize what the gaps were there. And I've talked to a number of leaders who have said, well, we realized, wow, we really didn't have the good, we didn't have the right tools. We didn't have the right technology. We had to acquire it quickly. It was very hard to acquire technology of certain types, as you know, early on in the pandemic, people actually ran out of things. I talked to a CIO who said, we cannot buy a laptop. Like they, you could, in their, their local community, you couldn't get a laptop, which is crazy, right? So how, what did we learn uh, from the pandemic in terms of process issues? Uh, Brent, let me turn to you on that first. Do you, did you have any um, revelations for yourself? Any epiphanies around that? Uh, I don't know if it was, I don't know if it was necessarily an epiphany, but we certainly saw behavior change overnight. So, you know, reluctant, stakeholders, uh, you know, in, in before the pandemic were much more creative and open-minded in terms of, you know, how do we get things scheduled? You know, how do we, you know, really take advantage of telemedicine? Um, you know, we were able to stand up a, you know, a tele-ICU effort, not only for UPMC, but outside. And just the, the, the barriers uh, and the length of time just came down quickly to, to make this make this stuff happen. And, you know, I think as we've kind of gone through that with, uh, with telehealth, you know, it comes back to um, working with our providers as well as our patients that this is, um, you know, a wonderful channel, but not the only channel to get, uh, get care. Um, yeah. And it's really just another way to have a conversation with your, uh, with your provider. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Arlen, what do you, what did you, learn or what what perceptions did you have based on some of the things that happened have happened during the pandemic with regard to um, this subject? so not surprisingly i'm going to be a little contrarian okay um, so first of all i wouldn't assume anything and it's the cute little saying that i have in other words um we're already seeing a drop in the use of telemedicine yeah and Two months ago, it dropped 25%. Last month, it dropped 5%. And the question real, I mean, and oh, by the way, the first patent for telemedicine was in 1924. So it took us 100 years to be famous overnight. 
And the question really is why? And I, and, and I don't say that facetiously, it's because people are people, they're human. And just like everybody else, they buy emotionally and they justify rationally. So I would not assume that a Zoom, to coin a phrase, that this thing has reached the tipping point and it's gonna to be totally integrated and it's just gonna be like, like I spoke with a guy who's in the banking industry and maybe Brett, you can relate to this. He said, you know, when I go to a bank, I don't go to a digital bank. I just go to a bank because they've incorporated all this FinTech and you don't worry about, you go to an ATM, you put your card in the machine and you get money in France. It's not digital banking, it's just banking. So will the same thing happen to sick care? And I say sick care because as we know, it's not healthcare. It's a totally dysfunctional, non-interoperable system of sick care systems that are sick. They're not connected and they haven't been for a very long time. And one of the challenges and what we're all trying to do is transform sick care to healthcare. 96% yeah. of the 3.8 trillion and growing goes to sick people. And progressively over the last five years, budgets for public health infrastructure have dropped. Guess what? COVID came along, surprise, surprise. So we, we really need to sort of rethink wellness, preventive medicine, chronic disease management, public health initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. Now, do, do I see that happening? Um, maybe. I, I think what's happening is, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. Back in the day, I was, I was the chairman of uh, the academies, the American Academy of Otolaryngology Telemedicine and Telehealth Committee, which incidentally was created in the very early, late 80s. It went nowhere. I mean, it's, and even still today, telemedicine is rarely applicable in ear, nose, and throat surgery or in otolaryngology for many, many reasons, but it just isn't. So it's a very low penetration, maybe 15%. So the second is there's a big difference between entrepreneurship by necessity and entrepreneurship by choice. And usually that has to do with the state of the economy or a crisis. The bad news is that if you get involved in entrepreneurship by necessity, telemedicine, virtual care, all the stuff we're talking about, that has a limited clinical half-life because as I said, you have to have skin in the game and have to be motivated to do it, not just to take advantage of an economic window of opportunity. So I'm skeptical about how much all of this is really gonna stick. And finally, I think the things that will eventually determine whether these things will stick are rules, reimbursement, revenue targets for corporate America, and the status of the economic recovery following COVID. I'm very concerned that the increasing consolidation of medicine and with all due respect to my esteemed colleagues on the panel, no more better demonstrated by the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Pittsburgh, God bless them, and the University of Colorado, which has sort of eaten up most of the state into Wyoming and Northern New Mexico. The increasing consolidation of medicine further will exacerbate what has been referred to as the iniquity of inequity. And we can, we can turn out as much tech stuff as we want, but a relatively few percent of the population will be able to take advantage of it because of the, in, the structural inequality in the American system. So I have, I have concerns about the hype and all the kumbaya and all, the poly, you know, all this stuff because there are firm structural problems now I play in a world where we're trying to reconcile the ethos and professionalism of business with the ethos and professional of medicine, and they frequently conflict. They're not virtuous. So we, we, have, to, we have to deal with that. It's just, and some would argue, you know, the culprit's fee for service medicine. Some would say lack of universal insurance. It goes on and on and on. Those are my concerns. And finally, cost. 
I, there is no Moore's law in sick care technology. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 30 to 40% of the growth in US GDP spending on sick care arguably is anywhere from 25 to 40%. I don't see my health insurance premiums going down. So what makes you think that all this technology is gonna drop the aggregate cost, not the cost to a given individual or a given hospital, the aggregate cost, which we as the taxpayer have to assume. We're the ultimate single payer. Nobody writes the check except for us, either in foregone wages or in taxes. Everybody else just redistributes the money. A lot of issues you brought up there, including, of course, um, something that we won't be able to solve on this panel, which is the underlying um, causes of the increase in healthcare costs of the system, including the aging of the population and the explosion in chronic illness. But I do appreciate very much your pointing to larger issues, Arlen. I think that's very important. When we look at some of these options, um, let me go back to you, John. Um, what is it, and, and obviously each, uh, every solution that you could be talking about has its own features and it has its own context, but as a broad principle, what are the dis key distinguishing factors at, uh, determining whether purchasing a particular solution will make the cut or not? In other words, um, that it is, it can be proven to show an ROI, that it has a, um, a great track record, um, that it addresses a need that can't be addressed in, other, in any other way. Kind of what are the broadest principles that you and your, your colleagues look at? Sure, Mark, and, and much of this will fit into the framework that Arlen presented with his 5i. So I think, first of all, it's gotta be addressing a pain point. If it doesn't address a pain point, we don't have the cycles to even talk about it. Secondly, if it addresses a pain point and it's somewhere on our roadmap or we need to address it, I think we need to look at how we integrate it in our existing um, technology. So we use as a lens, um, I think Brent had his three Cs. Our three Cs are common systems, centrally managed, collaboratively implemented. So it's gotta be based on a common system. So for us, you know, it's one of a handful of systems that we have in place. Our preference is not to introduce a, another third party that we need to figure out how to get and interoperate. And then lastly, it's really holding people accountable on the back end for the benefits. So what, I had shared what was, the, you, what was the third C, common system centrally managed and what was uh, the What we call collaboratively implemented. And this oh, is a little right. bit of our secret sauces. You know, I've been in a lot of organizations where you, you have a big project and it fails and they say, boy, the IS people stink or the CIO is no good. You know, we try to make things um, operations projects where we participate. We both have skin in the game. And we have found that that's a little bit of a secret sauce that helps us not have T projects. Yeah. Uh, so, and then the last piece, what I was starting to say, Mark, is um, really holding people accountable for the benefits realization. Uh, you know, many times people say, we're going to cut five heads, we're going to reduce, and then, you know, the project's over and people walk away and move on to the next project and never get held accountable. We publish uh, on a biannual basis a uh, hardcover benefits realization. There's obviously a digital copy available, right. but we hold ourselves accountable to um, publishing our benefits realization. It gets audited by our CFO and some external people. And we really find that that makes people um, think twice before they say, trust me, this is going to be a good project. Yeah. Those are the things that really help us. You know, there, there's some other stuff like we have an architecture review board. We've got our information security assessment. So it's a very tactical things that, you know, a vendor or a product will have to go through before we go ahead and move forward. Great. Well, one thing is very clear. Our panelists believe in alliteration. We've got a lot, of, <laughs> we've got I's and C's. Uh, Brent, you, you, you're not required on the spot to come up with the five T's, but, uh, <laughs> or the five S's, but when you look at some of the criteria or elements that John and Arlen have mentioned, how do those mesh with the way you see solutions acquisition right now? Yeah, I think uh, you know certainly the the five eyes the way that Arlen described them resonates uh, with us, and again we follow a very similar process. And I wrote down John's three C's, in particular the the central management 
and what that means, you know, and, and maybe we can unpack that one together because what we see when working with other partners outside the system or working with some young companies or even within UPMC is it's, it's fairly straightforward to get a pilot. And I think Arlen, you, you know, I, I use the word pilotitis. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you refer to it as Arlen, but it was a similar theme in, in, in how do you, you know, and that's a fairly straightforward process to find, you know, one of our 40 plus hospitals to engage with that. But the key part is where John was, was going, I think, is, is around, you know, how do you think beyond that? So, you know, what's the plan? What's the central organization to, you know, take that, in our case, to 40 plus hospitals once we've proven it out at one or, or two? Um, you know, we, we, you know, certainly have lots of lessons learned and, you know, we have a PMO organization as well as our, our centralized CTO uh, group working together on, you know, maps for these enterprise-wide deployments. Um, and, you know, how do we hold that first pilot accountable and be really honest with ourselves on like, this is working, this is not. And if it is, then how do we kind of take it to the next pod and the next pod and the next pod? And that's, that's something that, uh, you know, we work, work hard on every single day. Great, great. Yeah, and I, and I think you also brought, well, implicitly brought something up, which is this is always going to be iterative, iterative. And we're always going to be in this state of flux, right? Like there won't be a moment like say July 15th, 2021, where everything will freeze and we will we'll be able to make decisions with the world frozen. Um, we'll always have uncertainty um, and we'll always be in a state of transition to something different, right? I, I think that's one of the challenges here. What is, um, when we look at how healthcare IT people have been seen, I want to talk a little bit about perceptions for a moment. Um, we did a panel, um, a week ago about um, CIOs 2.0. And we were talking about the idea that, um, and I spent some time elaborating on this, you know, the, fir the first CIOs, as I like to say, were Joe from the basement and someone decided they were the CIO. And Joe said, oh, wow, that's so nice. I, what, what is a CIO? This would have been about 1989, right? And so we had to define it. But one of the things that it took a long time for people to rethink was the implicit bias of perceiving healthcare IT leaders as order takers, right? And that bias was not irrational. It was based on, you know, 25 years ago in the typical hospital, to the extent that you had any information systems outside of ERP and finance, you would have departmental information systems, right? And those are, those are usually chosen by the clinician and staff leaders. So in cardiology, you might have a specific system or dermatology or whatever. And it was like, oh, well, let's ask Joe to order something or whatever. That thinking was very endemic to how we thought about technology. What we're asking of CIOs and other senior healthcare IT leaders now patient care organizations is to be actual leaders and to help us think about how we leverage technology to advance the profound strategic objectives of the organization and hopefully of healthcare in general. How does everyone think about this now in terms of really engaging um, end users, end user leaders, clinician executives, whoever the appropriate people are into the process so that it is so much not any longer this kind of order taker process. Do you know what I'm talking about? So that you're leading as John, you, you talked about earlier, you're leading essentially thinking processes, right? Like what do we need and why do we need it? Where are we going as an organization? How does this fit into our strategic objectives? So I'll, I'll start real quick. So, you know, you hear me describe our corporate IS team and you know, many folks across the country called IT and, and we called IS intentionally. And, and it's because we really have a services orientation. So that's the first thing I think of when you think of perception is, 
you know, what are your people doing out there? Are they technologists that are doing technology for the sake of technology or are they service oriented people? So that's really deep into sort of how we view ourselves. Um, two is we, we really have spent some money and time making sure that our analyst level people uh, behave like consultants. So we, we try to train them to be consultative, go out there and really understand what the business problem is and really understand how to marry the right technology solution with the right problem. And then the last piece that kind of strikes me is, is more of um, like solution selling is as you're pitching a vision to the senior leadership team, wouldn't it be nice mm. if we had a single EMR that could be integrated yeah. with, you know, so those are the three things I think of from a perception perspective versus the old school of, hey, it was that order taker CIO. Yeah, yeah, that that comports completely with what my thoughts were, John. Brent? A handful of, uh, of, of thoughts that come up and, in, in, you know, talking about corporate uh, IS, you know, our, our group, we are, you know, we're effectively our incubator and it's been called our innovation arm or our venture arm. And, and um, we've worked hard over the last several years of kind of flipping that nomenclature to have that service oriented mindset and partnering with our, our uh, corporate IS group and, and not being kind of the, the shiny object uh, crowd, which I think is, is, is part of the, the challenge that, that groups like ours have. And so moving kind of beyond the science projects, particularly in digital solutions to really solving the, the hard problem within the system and weaving ourselves in with corporate IS. Um, you know, innovation just doesn't happen in sharp, shops like ours. It's across the system. And, you know, some of our best innovators are, you know, working in our corporate IS group on, you know, things like adaptive trials. Um, and so I think that's, that's one mindset that we have. And again, I think, you know, just building on John's that building that consultative or service oriented uh, mindset, and then really talking about technology solutions, and not just the technology, we have numerous algorithms or a specific capability that come through our shop. And, you know, my team will, you know, make fun of me, but I'll ask, okay, so what, how are we going to, you know, how, what's the care manager going to do about this? How do we actually weave this into the workflow? And how do we build the solutions to handhold them through this um, and not just kind of deliver the, the black box? Um, so it's kind of woven into the fabric of, you know, where our CIO is headed and the corporate IS group. Wonderful. So now I wanted to wait until now, until we had talked about broader principles. Now let's talk about vendors. <laughs> what is it, you know, I, I often speak with CIOs and other senior healthcare IT leaders and patient care organizations. Uh, they are, they, they're getting calls and emails and whatever. Uh, I'm sure people are sending candy, uh, you know, every week. And um, it can be very difficult amid that like tsunami of pitches and messaging to, enter into fruitful discussions, fruitful from your standpoint, the leader of a, uh, the healthcare IT leader in the patient care organization uh, with all these vendors um, to, to kind of figure out who you even want to have a longer conversation with beyond the two minute one. Um, what is, how should we um, think about how we interact with vendors who might be potential partners going forward. Um, what's important to know right now, you know, at the beginning of this panel, I talked about greater needs than ever, you know, um, and yet we're, we have restrained, restrained budgets as well. Um, when we look at some of these new solutions that are coming out, how do we form perceptions about what, what might be worthwhile investigating or not? Yes, I would go ahead. Um, so you'll forgive my uh, uh, mnemonics again and my. Uh oh, but, uh, it's, we're it's getting R's or S's, right? right? No, it's. I'm writing it down, Arlen. It's 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 the doctor mentality in med school. Everything has to have a mnemonic. So it's just one of those things. Um, uh, my observation is that. Um, that we have 
have not done a good job. When I say we, I mean the C-suite soup. I call it the C-suite soup because the, the titles, the personas, the persona, the dramatis persona have expanded exponentially. Chief experience officer, chief innovation officer, chief blank officer. I mean, there's a list of, just goes on and on and on and on. I call them the and, O's. Yeah, whatever. And, um, <laughs> and people, particularly the doctors and the people that increasingly are being more and more employed at these institutions, they look at charts that see the growth of administrators way beyond the growth of grunts in the trenches. So I think, I think that the, the issue, so that the headline to me is, we do not do a good job of creating an understanding and clarifying expectations between the vendor and the vendee. We, we just don't do a good job of ex educating. Like this conversation, I'm hoping that people will download and listen to Listen, if you want to pitch something to John or Brent, here are the T's you got to cross and the I's you got to dot. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. And you're not, and don't waste your time if you can't do that. So we need to do a better job of educating potential vendors to vendees and vice versa. Number two, we have to create a better experience. So that's the second E. Because now the vendor vendee experience is you're just looking for ways to say no. And, and you got a million things on your plate. It's just like venture capital. It's the same mentality. You get a gazillion pitches a day and you're just looking for ways to say no. That, that's the perception that I think doctors have of potential vendees. Number three, if it's a lousy experience, then it's very poor engagement. They're simply not engaged because they're figuring, well, these guys aren't interested. I'm just blowing smoke. It's just a lot of work. It's going to go nowhere. I got to deal with an 18-month decision cycle. I got eight people on a buying team, all of whom have different personas and may or may not are resistant to change, risk averse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody wants a different value proposition. So between the education piece, the poor and uh, uh, experience piece, and by experience, I mean, so you're a care innovation center at a hospital and you don't get to talk to anybody about your idea. You have to submit your idea on a form. And that does not enable trust. It's just not a good way of, I don't know anybody who likes customer support from a tech company. It's horrible. So I'm saying we need to fix that. So education, engagement, experience. And then finally, the last E, pardon, is enablement. We, we want to enable us to work together to John's point as a service, not as an order taker. It's very, very hard for people to get through the gatekeepers to even know who the heck you folks are. Who is the decision maker? Should I be talking to the CFO? Should I be talking to an analyst? Should I be talking to someone? Who do I talk to? And if you, and I'm a grown up, if you tell me, listen, God bless you. We like your idea. Just not a good fit. Maybe we can give you some other resources or places to go. So I, I think those are the, the main, and so fundamentally, what does all that boil down to? A lack of trust. And, and it just doesn't work if you can't trust each other, either saying yes you know, nobody wants to call your baby ugly, but the fact is your baby's ugly. It just doesn't work. So make it prettier. Figure out another place to do it or whatever. You're not solving the right problem. So that's, that's basically what I think. And, and I think what that has resulted in is we've gone from a high touch to a high tech to a low trust sick care environment. And, and that's what's impeding progress. Well, I have to say, Arlen, I actually, the other day I was walking down the street and I saw someone pushing a very ugly baby in a stroller. And <laughs> I, did. I thought, wow. You know, <laughs> you know well, and I was like, 
I was just say, say, there aren't a whole, yeah, there aren't a lot a whole lot of newborns. I delivered twenty four babies as an intern. I can tell you, none of them were real pretty. Yeah, well, it's the, what I was going to say is, of course, if you happen to see that parent, uh, I think it was actually a dad in this case, not a mom, with a child, you'd say, "Such a sweet baby," right? Like, <laughs> no, you wouldn't. You would never say, "Oh, such an ugly baby." Anyway, I just had to throw that in there. So, um, per that though, John and Brent. How do we flip that conversation per some of the comments Ireland was making? I, I think where I'd like to kind of steer it is, um, I think certainly in your position, John, you're actually an educator part-time, right? You might not think of yourself that way, but you are. I mean, you're, you're saying, um, we have this huge smorgasbord of choices, right? Uh, have you ever, have you guys seen that book, Eat This, Don't Eat That? It's like, it's like that, right? Yeah. Like, like eat this healthy version of the sandwich, don't eat this horrible. And when you have these conversations internally with the stakeholders, what does success look like uh, in terms of looking at um, solutions on the market? So I mean, a couple of things come to mind is you could spend all day, and I'm sure Brent, maybe in Arlen could too, just answering calls from vendors that want to talk to you about their product. So you have to figure out some way to shield yourself from that. Um, you know, I tend to use the, the terminology, you know, Goldilocks. It's, it's, it's got to be, can't be too hot, can't be too, too cold in terms of engagement with me. So, you know, if I say, Mark, I like what you're talking about, but we're not going to be ready for a year to take a look at that. Well, if you call me in three weeks, I'm not going to be happy. You know, if you, if you follow up in the time that I sort of illustrated, I think we're good to go. But I spend the bulk of my time trying to figure out ways to sort of get rid of that noise because it detracts me from doing what I get paid to do all day long. Um, occasionally, something will come to my desk that's either part of our roadmap or it's funded or it's something that really looks like it's got some merit. And then we can begin to go through that governance product. But even there, or process, but even there, I'll say things like, where have you done this before in academic healthcare? And, and it stops people in their tracks. Well, we haven't. And, you know, we don't tend to live on the bleeding edge as an organization. We're what uh, Gartner calls a fast follower. So we'll watch Brent and his group do it and we'll say, okay, we saw how good that went. That's something we want to jump on the bandwagon with. But we, we follow fast, but we don't often lead. We, we're not the first organization in the country to do something. And, and I find that that detracts, you know, or, or deflects some of those. And Sometimes they go away and come back and say, hey, we got three clients and now I'm ready to talk to them. Now, you know, it's just in our sweet spot of the product maturity and, you know, we want to be you know, sort of on the front edge of that kind of stuff. But I, I won't take things forward for governance unless it's really been identified as something that we should be focusing on as an organization. Because as we talked before, we've got big organizations. And if all of our people are out there pursuing the latest and greatest, you know, we're, we're diluted in terms of, you know, what we're working on. And, and we produce a, a map of the top five things that we're working on at any given time. And, you know, in the old days, I used to walk by people's desk and say, I want to see that on your desk, because if it's not one of these five, we should be talking about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's things like that. I know it sounds very rudimentary, but it, it's, it's really important to keep your folks focused on things and not chasing, you know, Brett talked about earlier, the shiny things, unless you need a shiny thing. Yeah. So I, th I think that's perfect, John. I, I think, we, you know, one of the key things is, you're, you're creating, you continue to create a culture in which people are learning, continuously learning, and they're thinking about the overall mission and vision and objectives of the organization rather than, oh, this shiny object seems like a cool thing to maybe look at this one area. It has to fit into the larger picture. Correct. Uh, Brent, your thoughts on that? Sure, I, I, I'll, uh, I will kind of split out a couple of thoughts. I mean, one, if it's a more mature solution, it, you know, it tends to, we tend to look more kind of the end to end solution and kind of all the technology and the change management pieces I think we described. I think if, you know, Mark, your question's really about the earlier companies mm -hmm. and, you know, what I have really appreciated about UPMC is just the, the mindset and the willingness to take, you know, risk on some of these things. And, you know, as, as everybody here knows, you know, any of these early companies within 10 questions, you can find a reason to say no. And I think we've culturally have really worked within our group of kind of flipping the question of what do we have to believe to make this 
work. And it's a, it's a, it's a you know, it's a different, different phrasing. I think it's, it's, uh, it's helped us get traction on a lot of things. Um, I think as we're partnering with the young companies, uh, I think it's also, this is a partnership um, and it's not only hearing about the solution, but also having them be vulnerable and here's where we're strong and here's where we're not. And so if we know where, you know, there are uh, places to improve because it's a young company, like no one has everything, you know, understanding what those vulnerabilities and things we need to work on together, that's where we can jump in and help and help manage through the process and, you know, success with a pilot and hopefully beyond. Yeah, perfectly said. So we, we just have a few minutes. I'm going to ask each of you um, to share one final thought with our audience, either a piece of advice with regard to everything we've talked about or a prediction for what might happen in the next couple of years. And everyone has one minute, so <laughs> we have to kind of compress this. Arlen, please go ahead. Um, I, I predict we'll continue to see uh, the lo low trust digital soup that I described. We will see uh, increasing efforts to reform medical education, which hasn't been reformed since 1912. We will continue to see inequity and digital divides and inequitable access and, and probably uh, possibly get worse in the 2022 election. And, and I think we'll continue to see the increasing growth of Sick Care Inc. in the United States, particularly driven by private equity. And that's going to create big problems. Yeah. Understood. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Brent, go ahead. This is nothing, you know, nothing new, but, you know, as, as you know, I'm really kind of putting myself in the, the seat of some of the young companies that, you know, may be on this, this phone and, and um, you know, really think about their, their customer and their partner and just the operating mindset and that, you know, budgets continue to be strapped, you know, they're working harder than ever. And I think when approaching it is, you know, how do we take things off of their desk and how do we, you know, articulate the cost and the value very clearly and earn their, earn their trust over, over time. Um, again, that's not earth shattering uh, advice, but I think maybe just a a reminder as we're, we're working with really, you know, strapped providers and care managers uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very wise. Uh, John. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of in the same boat as Brent. I don't think this is earth shattering, but I think of things in terms of being bimodal. So, you know, in our organization, the trains still have to hit the station on time, which means that the network needs to stay up. The applications need to be available around the clock. So those are the things that have to happen from an operational perspective. But you also have to have an eye out towards the right innovation at the right time. And, and that takes a slightly different lens. It takes a slightly different view. And you have to really be open to some of those things as they do pop up and, and recognizing them. Um, and then also, as I've learned with some innovative things, is uh, failing fast. You know, if things aren't going to work, you got to sort of accept that uh, the baby's ugly and we're going to move on to another one. Exactly. Um... We, we, we will hold everyone non-accountable for perceiving ugly, uh, ugly babies out there. Uh, but what I was gonna say is, um, I, I think that one could view this moment in healthcare uh, one of two ways, uh, either glass half empty or glass half full. And what I mean by that is, I do think that there are more needs than ever, legitimate needs, especially as we shift into value or volume. Um, and in some ways we have less money than ever, <laughs> which is a real problem. Um, but the glass half full view is we're on the verge of transforming healthcare delivery in this country. Uh, it will be hard. I agree with Arlen, it will be very hard, but I'm kind of a positive thinker overall. And I think that we have the chance now in, a, in an unprecedented way to leverage real solutions. There are so many good real solutions out there that really work, that really do things um, to transform uh, care delivery in this country. And I think this discussion has touched on a key element in all that, which is how we think about 
uh, purchasing and implementing solutions. Um, and I love that we've been able to talk about governance and project management at this level of depth because I think it's something people kind of crave, but they don't get, they don't hear enough discussions of. So I want to thank my wonderful panelists here, Arlen, Brent, John, you've been absolutely terrific. Uh, I think that our audience has learned a great deal and I know I have. So thank you all very much for being terrific panelists. Uh, we'll have you all back. Um, and in the meantime, never tell a parent their baby is ugly. <laughs> That's, I'll, I'll leave it. That's, that's like the third rail. So anyway, thank you all so much. It's been a great discussion and Matt Rayner has returned. Oh, thank you, Mark. Yeah, great parting advice. I appreciate that. I think we all do. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, panelists. A fantastic opening two sessions. We are now on a very short break. We're going to resume here with our next session at 11.45 a.m. Eastern time. This next session will be a presentation from HealthShare Exchange on supporting the Delaware Valley's COVID-19 response. So we will see you back here at 11.45. So we'll see you very soon. Thank you. Take care.